Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast. On this show, we talk with veterans, community leaders, Christians, and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey, folks. Today, I am joined by Mike Meharry. He is the communication director for the 10th Amendment Center and podcast host of Godarchy. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing outstanding. How are you, my friend? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. A little stopped up. My allergies are kicking my butt right now as usual. It's allergy season, man. Well, it seems like it's allergy season 24-7, 365 <laughs> days a year around Memphis. I don't know. Uh, I mean, yeah. even during the winter time, man, it just, it, it's crazy to me how, how it happened. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this article that you wrote for the 10th Amendment Center called The Trump Administration Wants to Resume Prosecuting Medical Marijuana Users in States Where It's Legal. Yeah, that's uh, an interesting development. You know, Trump has been all over the place on all kinds of issues. Uh, you know, I've had people remind me, well, you know, he's for criminal justice reform. And and he said before that he thinks that, it, you know, marijuana should be a state decision. And yet in his most recent budget, uh, he left out or wanted to cut out a provision that currently prohibits the Department of Justice from spending money to prosecute medical marijuana users in states uh, where it's legal. Uh, so he wants that funding restored, uh, which indicates that at some level, he must want to be able to prosecute medical marijuana users in states where it's legal. Um, What's even more egregious to me is that, you know, this has been a provision that Congress has put in spending bills since I think 2014. Uh, so, you know, even though federal prohibition of marijuana is still in place, there is some protection from uh, at least prosecution, you know, if you have a valid medical marijuana card and if you're following the laws of your state, uh, you're, you're not allowed to prosecute uh, at the federal level, you know, as long as you're meeting those criteria. And uh, Trump actually indicated in a signing statement on the last spending bill, which this provision was included in, uh, and and hinted at, I don't have to obey this. I don't, I don't have to follow this. I will. I think the way he put it is, we will enforce the law as uh, as we interpret it, and something to that effect. Uh, so it's almost as if the guy thinks he's king. You know, I mean. Uh, Ostensibly, it, you know, Congress makes the laws. If Congress puts a restriction on how that law should be enforced, then the president should be uh, obligated to follow that. But uh, not, not a, not Donald. Donald thinks he's above law, I guess, and he'll interpret it the way he wants to and enforce it the way he wants to. So, <laughs> King Donald. Yeah, King King Donald. It's funny because I, I remember whenever I uh, was a party line voting Republican. You know, I. I saw when when Obama was in president, I saw him the same way. Yeah. And for some reason now with Trump, I don't know if I'm seeing it from from a different lens because I was part of that, you know, that Republican Party. But it seems like to me, to me, Trump seems worse on, on some of these things than Obama. Yeah, I don't know if he's worse or not. Um, you know, it, it's hard to gauge that. And I really people will get angry with me. You'll have Trump supporters if, if they happen to tune in and they'll be like, oh, there's here goes my Harry, you know, Trump derangement syndrome. Ah. Uh, that <laughs> tends to be how how Trump supporters react with any negative criticism. It's not really a criticism of Trump per se. It's really a criticism of what the executive branch of the federal government has in, evolved into. I mean, I think in a lot of ways, Americans want a king. They want a president who will get things done and do whatever they want him to do. Now, they get angry when somebody that they don't like is in power and uses that same authority in ways they don't like. But it's not that they really uh, don't believe that the power should be used at all. They just want it to be used uh, for their own personal policy preferences. And that's really how we've gotten to where we are today. The party that is in power at the time will stretch the limits of presidential authority, and those supporters will be glad for it and cheer for it. And then you'll have an election cycle, and then the bad guy, quote unquote, will get in office. And all of a sudden, they'll be like, oh my gosh, how can he do this? Well, you know, uh, Trump is just following the legacy of Obama, who talked about, I'm going to, to uh, I, don't, I don't need Congress, I've got a pen and a phone, you know. Uh, 
Trump is just following that uh, that precedent. And and to be honest, Obama's following the precedent of of G- George Bush, and Bush was po- following the precedent of Clinton. I mean, you can tra- trace it all the way back for decades and generations of presidents. So it's really an example of what is wrong with the federal system. Uh, it's been flipped on its head. We have a situation now where we, in effect, do have a king. Congress has been uh, rele- relegated to a, an organization that makes um, – what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Makes recommendations that the president may or may not follow. Uh, of course, Congress is partly responsible for that because they've let it happen. Uh, and and then, you know, bigger picture, we have a federal government now that sticks its nose into every aspect of our lives, uh, you know, down to telling us how much water we can have in our toilets and what kind of light bulbs we can screw into our light fixtures. And that was not the system that the founding generation promised us. They promised a system that would be decentralized, where very little power would be at the federal level, that most governance would be at the state and local level. And again, we flipped it on its head and we've created this monstrosity, monopoly, centralized power that's uh, ruling with one size fits all edicts for 320 million people. It's absurd when you stop and think about it. And yet everybody seems to cheerlead for it as long as they're getting what they want in terms of policy. As long as there are guys in office, it's okay. Yeah. yeah. And I think uh, I did some study on the on the Constitution, and I had a, a small group that we'd put together in Northwest Arkansas. We were trying to get meetings together to where people come in, and we we would bring speakers in to teach about the Constitution. And one thing we tried to focus on was the Tenth Amendment itself. The state power, you know, is supposed to be you're supposed to have higher higher authority than the federal government. Yeah, exactly. You know, the Tenth Amendment is it, it's just what what's known as a rule of construction and it tells you how to read the Constitution. And even without the Tenth Amendment, the way the Constitution is written, it delegates specific powers to the federal government. You can go to Article One, Section Eight, you can find most of those. There's not very many. Uh, and if it's not written in the document, then the federal government's not supposed to be doing it. And that's that's all the Tenth Amendment does, is it it tells us to read the Constitution that way. Uh, we live in a world today where here's a true story. I've I've talked to more than one lawyer who has taken the bar exam, and they will tell you in law uh, bar exam preparation courses, you know, they'll say if you ever get a uh, a multiple choice question and one of the answers is the Tenth Amendment, you can immediately eliminate that answer. That's not going to be the correct answer. They say so. The Tenth Amendment is always the wrong answer on the bar exam. You know, this is a far cry from Thomas Jefferson, who said that the Tenth Amendment was the cornerstone and foundation of the Constitution. Um, so it's it's totally flipped on its head, and and I don't get it. I don't understand why people want this kind of centralized monopoly government. I mean, you wouldn't want, uh, you know, a monopoly in groceries. You wouldn't want Walmart to be the only place you could get your groceries. Uh, if if anybody proposed that, the people would protest, and they would say, "Oh, it would be awful. It would be higher prices, and we'd get awful service, and." Uh, you know, all these horrible things that would happen. Uh, But then when it comes to government, they want that monopoly. And it's bad for all of the same reason. Basically, the federal government is Walmart. Let's let's just put it that way. (laughs) I don't even like going to Walmart. (laughs) So what what do you think changed? I mean, why have we gotten to where we are? Because to me, media adds way too much to this as far as mainstream media. You know, they focus so much on on the the actions of the federal government. Oh yeah, and people follow it, you know, like it's gospel. And I, I don't, I don't know. To me, I, I blame the media for a lot of the problems we're having right now. But then you go people that are 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 still involving themselves with this. You know, they they watch Fox News or CNN or MSNBC, like that's where they're supposed to get their news from. Instead of actually going back and reading what the founders set up for us, you know. And I'm not saying the Constitution is perfect by any means, right? Right. But I, and I was telling talking to somebody last night at work about it. You know, if 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 we got back to just to that, if they if the Constitution was followed, how it was supposed to be followed, we'd be a whole lot better off. It wouldn't be perfect, but it would be a whole lot better off. And now we're so far away from it. I don't think there's any any going back, which honestly is what, what kind of led me to anarchism. You know, my my study of the Constitution led me directly to anarchism. I don't know if that makes any sense to you or not, but... <laughs> it absolutely makes sense because that's basically, you know, that's the journey that I took. 
uh, as well. And people think it's funny. And I hate the term anarchist because it has connotations. Right. So you, you say that word and a lot of people are going to say, oh, you're one of those guys throwing rocks through right. windows and setting dumpsters on fire. No, that's not what we mean. We're just talking about uh, essentially self-rule and self-ownership. I like the term voluntarism. Um, of course, nobody knows what that means either. But uh, Right. Well, see, I've, I've heard you mention that before in your podcast. Yeah. And I'm on the flip side. I kind of like using the term anarchist because it's <laughs> because it generates a trigger. Right. Yeah, it does. It's true. And it, it's, but then I can talk to them about voluntarism as well, whenever because right. I can tie the two together because they're basically the same thing, best I can tell. Sure, absolutely. But um, you know, I I, I totally understand where you're coming from uh, because you know I I think we probably had some similar journeys in our political life. I came from the right. I was the card carrying Republican, Rush Limbaugh, listening. GOP loving, uh, you know, kind of religious right. That's that's the world that I came from. Got involved with the Tenth Amendment Center uh, because I always had this sense that you know limited government. Because you know Republicans talk about limited government, right? Until they're in charge, <laughs> you know that goes out the window when they're in charge. But when they're out of power, they talk about limited government and and, and make a good, you know, at least uh, at least have the rhetoric down. So. I always kind of believed in that. And as I got involved in the work of the Tenth Amendment Center, I very quickly remembered that Republicans are just as bad on the Constitution as the as the Democrats are. Exactly. Um, but yeah, you know, from a a philosophical standpoint, I'm absolutely a voluntarist or an anarchist or, or whatever term you want to use. I, I don't believe that the state should exist. I don't believe that it has moral legitimacy. Uh, so people find it amusing that oh this dude works for the Tenth Amendment Center and just finished writing a book about the Constitution you know what, what that doesn't make any sense and it's just exactly what you said I think that uh, it's important to have ultimate principles it's also important to have a pragmatic strategy if you're going to engage the political system at all and I think as you said from a practical standpoint the decentralization. Uh, structure uh, that the Constitution gives, at least gives us a starting point to work toward. And if nothing else, it allows us to uh, shine a spotlight on the fact of, of how much this idea of limited government has failed us. And uh, I think it's important to point that out. So, you know, certainly it, it does that because like you said, we've, we've drifted so far. And you ask a really good question, why has it happened? I think the the media is a big part of it. It focuses completely on the national uh, stage. I think a lot of it has to do with education. You know, government runs the education system, so the government has a vested interest in uh, spinning its narrative through the school systems. And that narrative is is that we have one nation, centralized power, all emanating from D.C. Uh, I think where it really changed, honestly, was you know the Civil War and the years after, when basically Lincoln. Uh, said to the South, no, you you may not have political autonomy, and if you try, we will kill you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that that really created this one nation narrative. So there's a lot of reasons we are where we are. I think it's important to to examine that and look toward it. And I think if we're going to, you know, involve ourselves in the political process, as uh, Murray Rothbard once said, it, it, libertarians have to learn that parroting ultimate principles is not enough to cope with the real world. And so I think that uh, if we choose to engage in the political process, and and there's certainly a good arguments not to, uh, I respect people who don't, but if you're going to, then the Constitution is certainly a place that you have to start, uh, at least in the American system. Well, it reminds me of a conversation that I had with a friend because even still to this day, you know, as an anarchist, I'll still, when I'm talking to a Trump supporter or an Obama supporter, no matter who's in office, and I can point out their unconstitutional acts, somebody asks me, goes, well, why do you even talk about the Constitution to people when you yourself claim to be an anarchist? Well, then I go back to, well, the, the study of the Constitution led me to where I am now. And if I can get people thinking to show them that their their favorite guy that they've got in office right now has no regard for the United States Constitution, and the next guy's not going to have any regard for it. What's the point? You know, you get to a point where we're going to like we need to look for something else. And I'm not saying anarchy would be would be perfect either. No, of course not. I mean, any any system of where you have a bunch of people together is going to have problems because you have uh, you have sinful nature and selfishness and greed and whatnot, but. I can't imagine anything being worse than what we have today in terms of uh, just 
horrible deadliness. You know, I mean, you look at what the system of states has given us, it's war after war after war. So, uh, you know, if nothing else, if we minimize the state, we would minimize the, the global conflicts and that would be less dead people, which I think is probably a plus. I don't know. Less de- <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be a plus as well. Less dead people, less theft. There was a something, a point you made in your article that I want to get back to. And without reading the entire bill, you said uh, Congress won't likely end the current policy of non-interference. President Obama also lobbied to have the provision stripped from the spending bills during his tenure in the White House. But Trump has taken things to another level, hinting that he would ignore Congress and enforce federal marijuana prohibition in states where medical cannabis is legal despite the congressional directive. What do you think? What do you think his motivation behind this by taking that extra step? What do you? What, and I, I don't know. I don't. I hesitate to say this, but the people he surrounded himself with, you know, when he said he was going to drain the swamp, well, I think he's added to it. And these, this, I, I don't even know if you'd call them spiritual advisors, but the people he surrounded himself. Do you think he's trying to legislate morality with, with this? What do you think he sees marijuana as, as uh, an evil? I have no idea. You know, I, my sense is, and, and this is just purely speculation on my part, but my sense is that that in the first place, I don't think he's really grounded in any kind of real real principles. He's a pragmatist through and through. Uh, I would imagine that somebody along the line has told him that uh, he needs to be a little tougher on the drug war to uh, appeal to his base. But I don't know that. I mean, the guy is all over, all over the place on a lot of different things. You know, he'll say one thing one day, and the next day he's done a flip flop, and he's saying something else. And you know, I mean, just just look at the the complete one eighty he's done in terms of the economy. Uh, you know, as a candidate, he was criticizing the Federal Reserve for all of its monetary intervention and its artificially low interest rates, and he called the stock market a big fat ugly bubble. And then he gets elected, and the Fed continues its policy, and the uh, stock market continues to inflate as a bubble, and all of a sudden he's taken it and branded it with a giant Trump T and taking credit for it. So, you know, I think he just does. I don't know. I, he, it almost seems like he he wakes up one day and sticks his finger in the air and uh, puts his other finger on his Twitter feed. And and I don't know. I don't have a whole lot of respect for him in terms of uh, of being a a deep thinker. <laughs> You know, obviously he's not stupid. He made billions of dollars in the real estate world and and he's got some acumen as a businessman, but uh, in terms of having any principles, I I can't answer your question is what I'm really getting around to. I have no idea why he's doing what he's doing. Uh, I I imagine somebody somewhere along the line told him to, and I think he does give a lot of deference to people he shouldn't. I mean, you just look at the fact that uh, he had Jeff Sessions as his attorney general for for those years. I mean, that guy was awful. Uh, He ramped up asset forfeiture. He ramped up uh, um, police militarization. uh, He's ramped up federal uh, enforcement of federal gun control. Uh, So all of these things that, that, you know, if you're a, a liberty lover are, bad news uh trump has at least tacitly supported based on the people he's put around him so uh, i i would say that probably has a lot to do with it but who knows i mean and tomorrow he may come out and say that he wants a federal uh prohibition of marijuana to be go away completely i mean you know that wouldn't shock me uh either but then again you know he was talking about the other day that it was a shame that they can't quickly execute drug dealers in the united states like they do in china so you know <laughs> wow i guess i missed that one I, I don't find it surprising. Yeah, yeah. I just saw that today, in fact. I don't find it surprising at all, but I, I missed that one altogether. He, uh... Hey, folks. Craig here. And I'd like to let y'all know we are always looking for writers to contribute to our blog. I don't care if you have any experience or not. Two or three of our contributors had no prior experience writing, and it turns out they have a real knack for it. Our project coordinator helps them put the articles together, and she publishes them on our website and Facebook page, and you will also have the option to come on the show and go more in-depth about your article. So if you like what we're doing at The Bad Roman and would like to try your hand at writing, then send us an email at thebadromanpodcast at gmail.com. We're having a blast with this project, and we would love for you to join us in helping promote it. Now back to the show. 
so it's kind of uh, kind of switched gears a, bit, a little bit and go back towards the his supporters and why I, I, you you had a, a Facebook post when I first reached out to you about this. It's something that kind of hit home to me too because I have a, I have a lot of frustration with with the support with his supporters. I, my I think my frustration lies more with them than it does with him. You know because they. They will excuse anything he does, regardless. I don't, and I'm paraphrasing what he said, but you remember when he said, uh, "I could shoot somebody in Times Square, my supporters would still follow me." Yeah, and I, I don't think he's lying. I mean, I think that they would still get behind him. They would, they would make excuses for it. You know, you can point out unconstitutional act. And I mean, you can just go straight to the Second Amendment. I mean, he's been to me. He's been worse than Obama was on on the Second Amendment. Absolutely, he did. He did the one thing that Obama never did. He he implemented new federal gun control. Yeah, and when you point that out to him, this I don't know, man. It's like they they're 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 not. It's not registering with them. You know, the Second Amendment was supposed to be a big thing for the for the conservatives. And when I say conservatives, air quote conservatives, right? You know, and and you point this out to him, you can go down. A uh, violation of his oath after oath or after violation after violation, and that doesn't register with him, and, I, and that's what frustrates with me because I've always always been of the opinion that that liberals are going to they're they're a lot more honest about their tyranny than than uh, conservatives are. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so they don't, I don't, I don't fault them as much. I mean, they tell us what they're going to do. Yeah, but then. Republicans won't, won't, won't they'll they'll pay lip service to liberty, but then they'll do stuff like Trump's doing with with the Second Amendment, and he it's completely excused because well at least it's not Hillary right you know because it could have been a whole lot worse if it was Hillary really I mean I don't I don't see it that way yeah I mean Hillary's a horrible person don't get me wrong but I'm I have a hard time discerning between the two they look a whole lot alike to me. Yeah, absolutely. The post that you mentioned uh, actually was a direct result of the frustration I was feeling from some of the backlash I was getting from that very article that we've already talked about with the marijuana stuff, uh, because I was getting you know more excuses and he didn't really say that or or you know just the whole people their response is without ever reading what I wrote. Oh, that's fake news, you know. <laughs> um, and, and I said, you know, th- this dude could put up put up a concentration camp and start locking up uh, conservatives. And, you know, the Trump supporter would say, well, yeah, if it was Hillary, we'd have two rows of barbed wire, you know. <laughs> I read that and laughed. That was pretty, that was like, that was good because it's accurate. You know, it, it is accurate and it's so freaking frustrating. And, and, you know, for me, it comes from the work that I do at the 10th Amendment Center because all of these people, I've, I've got a lot of Facebook friends who... I collected through the Obama years, working through the 10th Amendment Center, speaking at Tea Party events when the Tea Party was a thing. And these are the people that are now angry with me all the time because I'm criticizing Trump. And I'm like, dude, this is I have not changed my position. I am saying the exact same thing that I was saying four years ago when you loved me. And now I'm you know, now I'm a libtard. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. It, it, it boggles the mind, the cult of personality that. Donald Trump has ma- managed to amass around him. And it's no different than the cult of personality that uh, was amassed around Barack Obama. I mean, just think about how the anti-war movement completely evaporated. You know, they they were calling George Bush a war criminal and they weren't wrong. Uh, but all of a sudden, when it was Obama's wars, you know, we got a Nobel Peace Prize out of it and the anti-war left just completely disappeared uh, with the exception of some a uh, handful of principled true leftists, so you know this isn't again. It's not something that's ex- exclusive to conservatives or to Trump supporters. It's what politics has evolved into uh, here in the United States, and I would suspect worldwide. People are more interested in the personality in who holds power, who is at the seat of uh, you know who can sit around the table. Uh, they're more concerned with that than actually following any principles. And, you know, like you said, it's just when you look at the actual, what has he done? There's really not a whole lot of difference policy-wise between 
Barack Obama and Donald Trump. I mean, what's really changed? We still have the same wars. We still have the same unconstitutional spying that Trump has, has pushed hard to extend. We still have the same enforcement of federal gun control. We still have the same Federal Reserve policy. We have more spending. Uh, you know, we have trillion dollar deficits. Yeah, Obama ran trillion dollar deficits, but at least he had the excuse of the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. We're supposedly in the greatest economy ever in the history of the world. And yet we have government spending that looks like we're in the midst of the worst recession. So, you know, you can run down the list. I really don't think it would have been substantively different with the Hillary Clinton presidency. We wouldn't have gotten a tax cut. Uh, that's probably true. We might have gotten a moderate tax increase. Uh, so, you know, you, you could say that Trump has done some good things in terms of deregulation, particularly on the, the EPA front. I'll give him credit for that. And if this peace treaty with Afghanistan holds together, I would certainly give him credit for that. Although I read today that they've already bombed the Taliban. So, um, yeah, I see. Well, I remember I'm reading that I woke up and it was one of the first things I saw. And I remember reading that and. I, I read through it and I've it's, I'm still pretty skeptical. And then you just said that they just bombed the Taliban against so that's, that's hard to implement a peace deal if you're still going to drop bombs on them. So this is what I tell people. I mean, here we are, we're in the midst of the election. We just had super Tuesday yesterday as we're recording this. And you've already got people on both sides talking about how this is the most important election in the history of our lifetime, you know, in the history of ever. And, you know, I'm I don't know how old you are. I'm 53 now. So I've been through quite a few most important elections of my lifetime. It seems like every single <laughs> one has been the most important election of my lifetime. And here's what I tell people. I'll, and I'll say this again. I've said this in every election uh, since I, quote unquote, got woke. Uh, no matter who is elected in 2020, I guarantee you in 2024, the federal government will be more powerful. It will be deeper in debt. There will be more infringements on your liberties. and uh, I, did I mention that the government would be bigger? I guarantee it. It doesn't matter if it's Trump or Bernie Sanders or you know Joe Biden or I guess not Bloomberg now. Although he won uh, American Samoa, I don't really understand why he dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that. I, I've tried to stay away from from it. So at work in our in our break room, we have two TVs. One's on ESPN and one's on Fox News. And I always sit with my back to Fox News, but for some reason, and I don't know if. Fox News listeners have trouble hearing, but that TV is always turned up a right. lot louder than ESPN. So I got to try and find the remote to turn it down because it's, I'm, and I, I don't know, you know, the, the cringe emoji that you can use. I think I walk around with that look on my face quite a bit, especially when oh. politics are being discussed, but I try to. And it's like, it's like the Fox News and the CNBC and the MSNBC and those news channels, CNN, they like they managed to distill the awfulness down to its pure awfulness. You know, it's like it's like uh, watching that news. It's like politics. Uh, it's the moonshine of politics. You know, you're drinking pure alcohol, and it just makes your whole stomach go. Whoa. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not no no offense to people who like to drink pure alcohol. You know, <laughs> to you, but, um, no, yeah, it's uh, that's that's the worst. Well, man, I think uh, I don't know if you have anything else, but I, I did see that you have a new book out and. I do want to check it out. I have a lot of respect for the work that you're doing for the 10th Amendment Center and your knowledge behind the Constitution. At my current political, you know, where I'm at right now, I don't study it as much, but I do like to read about the Constitution still because it's still, you can still use it, you know, when you're trying to talk to people about right. the, the, the evils of government, you know, what they're doing, you know, they're, they're not even following their own oath. Well, you know, and two, it's history, and and I think there's value in knowing your your own history. Um, as Tom Woods is fond of saying, you know, you don't want to walk around and be an, an ignorant barbarian. So, <laughs> yeah. So it's so it's always good. To, it's always good to learn, even if you if you think that the Constitution has no uh, legitimacy in terms of, of moral or ethical legitimacy. That's certainly an argument. You know, the the whole Lysander Spooner of, of no authority. Um, Spooner was was brilliant in that sense. Well, I think the older I've gotten and when I was when I was doing some study on the constitution, I was I've turned into a kind of a history buff as far as that. So, you know, Patrick Henry was probably my favorite of all the founders. I read a couple of books on him and Yeah. I uh, I think honestly this reading some of his stuff, I think he was to me was an anarchist without being an anarchist if that makes sense. You know, some of the stuff that he taught, but yeah, the whole 
history behind it and the letters they were writing together was really intriguing to me. It's interesting too, you know, to think about the Constitution as a as a road stop, uh, you know, along the pathway of the evolution of political thought. Because the idea of a written Constitution was actually very radical. Uh, you know, the idea of the people being sovereign and, you know, I don't agree with the fact that a group can be sovereign. Uh, individuals are sovereign ultimately, but that was a huge leap forward because before the king was sovereign and then parliament was sovereign, uh, the idea that people, you know, had authority over government was unheard of until about a hundred years before uh, the American Revolution. That's when that kind of started to change. So it is interesting. It's almost to me like when you look at the evolution of political thought, it's almost like we got to to 1776 and and we got the Constitution and then it's like it stopped and they didn't ever get to the next level. And, you know, it's Thomas Jefferson, I think, was was close because uh, he actually wrote a letter where he talked about the fact that he questioned whether a constitution could bind the next generation. He kind of recognized the idea that uh, the next generation can't consent to what this generation consented to. So he was getting there. But anyway, if people are interested in in the history, in the constitution, uh, I just released a book about uh, a month and a half ago. It's called Constitution Owner's Manual, the real constitution the politicians don't want you to know about. And what I do is I go through the various clauses, so supremacy clause, general welfare clause, uh, the prelude, all of these clauses, and I explain what they were intended to mean, how they were sold during the ratifying convention, which is where I believe you find the true meaning of the Constitution. That's what was agreed to. Uh, and then I also get into some of the constitutional principles, uh, the idea of sovereignty and how that evolved and in, in the change between the American system and the British system. So I cover all of that. Uh, I think it's pretty easy to read. Tom Woods called it the uh, the best short introduction to the Constitution. So I thought that was pretty high praise. I did. I, I did actually listen to that episode with you on his show. That was that was a good one. Yeah, I, I think you know I think it's worthwhile to read. Uh, of course, I think it is. I took the time to read it or I took the time to write it. So, uh, but anybody that's interested in it in it can check it out. Uh, it's available on Amazon both uh, as. Uh, Kindle version and in paperback. Uh, it will soon be available as an audiobook on Audible. And I would actually be happy to send you a signed copy. You can find all the information you need. Just go to constitutionownersmanual.com and uh, the buying options are there and an overview of the book. So I've also written another book called uh, Our Last Hope Rediscovering the Lost Path to Liberty, which is about nullification, which in a nutshell is the uh, the idea that we can use state and local power to undermine uh, overreaching federal authority. Uh, so, you know, basically what the states have done with marijuana by legalizing it, they have undermined federal prohibition. The feds can't do anything without state and local cooperation. So when you withdraw state and local cooperation, uh, you undermine the federal government's ability to do stuff. And uh, so it naturally decentralizes the system. So that's uh, that's the other book that I've written. So my next project, I'm going to do a Godarchy book, and uh, kind of take the next step. So that's that'll be that's, fine. That's next on the uh, agenda when I maybe this summer I can start on that. So most of the people that are going to be listening to this are going to be familiar with your podcast. But if you want to go ahead, and, for those that aren't aware of it, if you want to go ahead and talk about that as well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, check out Godarchy.org. Uh, this is my, you know, this, the, the 10th amendment center is the work that I do. It's the pragmatic thing. It's how I engage. It also pays the bills. Uh, Godarchy is kind of my passion. And, uh, I, I started the website, I think back in about 2016 or 17. So the website's been around for a long time. Uh, and I just wanted to start writing about the interaction, uh, and the, the, interweaving of uh, the state and church. So it's anarchy or voluntarism, whatever word you want to use from a Christian perspective. And some people will automatically go, well, how can you be an anarchist and a Christian? That doesn't make sense. Well, I, I explain that. <laughs> uh, and there's a Godarchy podcast. Uh, you can find all of that at godarchy.org, articles, podcast, um, stuff like that. You can also follow Godarchy at, uh, on Facebook, which I think is just at Godarchy, or it might be at Godarchy or I can't remember. But you can find it. Just search Godarchy. Check it out. All right, man. Thank you. Have a good day. Peace, brother. 
Thanks for joining us this week on the Bad Roman Podcast. You can subscribe to the show wherever podcasts are found. And if you like what you hear, be sure to leave us a rating, as it is the best way to help other people find us. 100% of donations to the show are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about this week's guest and how you can support the show, please visit thebadroman.com. 